Hello, and welcome to A Sound Constitution here on CHLY 101.7 FM, a show where we focus on health topics important to our community. Our goal is to demystify health issues and address common misconceptions by sharing evidence-informed information from a variety of reliable sources. All information in our show will be available on our show notes on our Facebook and Instagram pages. We want to remind our listeners that the information presented in this show is for educational purposes only and does not replace the advice of your primary healthcare professional. If you have any questions or concerns about what's being discussed, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook at A Sound Constitution, our Instagram page at CHLY, A Sound Constitution, all one word, and our Twitter page at ASC underscore VIU, or email us at asoundconstitution at gmail.com. We would like to start our show by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Snanamo people, with a broadcasting range that overlaps the Kowatsin and the Slayamon territories. This acknowledgement is done with gratitude to the Snanamo people, with the intention to increase awareness about truth and reconciliation processes and effort on Vancouver Island. Additional information and resources surrounding Snanamo history, reconciliation, protocol, and land acknowledgement can be found on our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages. My name is Tyler, and I will be your host for today's episode. The topic in today's episode is health and wellness. Within this topic, we will be discussing ways to improve your mental, physical, and overall well-being. I am joined by my co-hosts, Ashley, Cassidy, and Ashley. We will be discussing resources within our community, stress management, and ways to improve your mental and physical health. Starting this episode off, I will be interviewing Cody Brown, a certified and experienced personal trainer who will inform us on how to implement a healthier lifestyle as well as what you should avoid when training at a gym. These topics are important as everybody's mental health has been affected by the lockdowns in 2020. I will be reinstating that we are providing information from reliable sources and all information is for educational purposes only. The information does not replace the advice of your primary healthcare professional. Starting this episode off, I would like to introduce Cody Brown, a certified and experienced personal trainer. In this interview, we discuss ways to implement a healthier lifestyle, explore strategies for working around busy schedules, steps to introduce a healthier diet, workout programs, supplementation and steroid use, and finally, how to work around financial limitations. Please welcome personal trainer, Cody Brown. Thank you for joining us today, Cody. Can you tell our listeners about your professional training? and education that you've completed to become a personal trainer and wellness coach. Thank you for having me. Uh, Yeah, so I got my certificate through ISSA, which is the International Sports Association. And I am currently working towards my specialization in strength and conditioning. Awesome. So what does that entail, um, working towards your specialization in strength and conditioning? So currently I am studying to essentially learn how to train as a sports athlete. So I already have a little bit of experience in sports training as I trained for hockey when I was younger, but this is just leveling up my education in that topic. Do you mind elaborating a bit more on how someone would enter the program that you're in and what kind of a workload it is for you? Yeah. So Essentially, you can talk to a counselor at ISSA and talk to them, see what they recommend. Uh, And then from there, uh, you get signed up and get your course load. So with that, you have all your quizzes that you have to do. You have your study material. And then it's basically just to learn at your own pace. Um, Study guide, essentially. And then from there... You just read the books, do the quizzes, and then at the very end, you have your final exam. And if you pass your final exam, then you are officially a certified personal trainer. And uh, how long is the program in total? 
Generally, it says seven to ten weeks. Okay, that's not too bad. Building off your fitness and everything, like what originally got you into it? What got you into the gym and training? And so, when I originally got into the gym, uh, it was a buddy of mine who sent me a message on Facebook Messenger. He asked if I wanted to go to the gym, and at that point in my life, I was going through a bit of a rough patch, so. I was willing to do pretty much anything to just get out of the house, and we ended up both falling in love with the gym. Very nice. How long have you been training for at the gym, personally? Uh, I have been training for seven years now. Seven years. Wow. Long time. And how would you recommend somebody who has never stepped foot into a gym to kind of introduce themselves to it and start going to the gym more consistently? I would say start off slow. There's no need to jump into a five or six day a week program. Uh, Start out slow. First, even just step into a gym. Most gyms give a free three day pass to check it out and see if you like it. So utilize it, go around, get the tour with one of their coaches. Um, They'll take you around the gym, show you different exercise equipment, show you what you'll be able to do. And then even after, you can continue to walk around the gym to just get yourself comfortable with the area and slowly ease yourself in. Even if it's one, two, or three days a week to start off, just something to get you in the door. That's great advice. Um, So what strategies do you recommend to people who are gotten into the gym but struggle with maintaining going consistently um, and lacking in motivation to go, what strategies would you recommend for them to use? Find a goal. When you find a goal, it makes sure that you have that discipline because you have this image in your mind of what you want to do, whether it's increasing weight, whether it's a physique goal, uh, whatever it is, weight loss goal, whatever it is, It'll allow you to not just use motivation, but also keep you determined to keep you going. Hmm. Yeah, because motivation, it can come and go, right? Yeah, Yeah. motivation comes in waves. So you can see a post on Instagram or something and get this instant spike of motivation, but motivation never lasts. So having that goal will keep you disciplined to keep you going. Right. And uh, what is a good workout plan to use when first starting out? This will entirely depend on how many days a week you can go to the gym. When you're just starting out, you're going to see what's called rookie gains. And you will notice that your muscle size will increase very fast. But then after those six months, you will notice it will slow down a lot. So my recommendation to my clients, if they're just starting out at the gym, is to do a more overall or a more well-balanced workout routine so that you are targeting every muscle uh, so that you can build up and not have any any weak points. Mm. So building a strong foundation for yourself. Exactly. Yeah. So entering the gym, some gyms can be really expensive. Others will not. For somebody who's just beginning and struggling financially or maybe may not have a lot of financial freedom to be spending on the gym, what strategies would you recommend there? Yeah, when you're just starting out and you're not there or it's hard to afford financially, you can start out just doing home workouts. So you can do body weight calisthenics, you can do yoga, uh, you can start off and get in extremely good workout routines just utilizing your own body weight so lots of push-ups crunches squats if you have a pull-up bar kind of thing exactly so say a client was just doing home workouts and they wanted to increase their body one way that they could do that would to be is start out small so say that's you know 10 push-ups next day aim for 15 or if they're struggling keep that 10 for the week and then slowly build their way up until they're doing 25 30 40 push-ups 
Start out small, work your way up. Yeah, start small. Uh, nobody starts at the end. Nobody walks into the gym looking like Arnold. So it's something that takes a lot of time and, and effort. Yeah. So with working out and everything, there's a huge market for supplements. What supplements do you recommend people take for the gym? And what are the most beneficial ones to be taking, especially when first starting out? So when you first start out, supplements are not necessary. Supplements are something that you can put in if it's something that you're lacking. So I would even talk to a nutritionist um, about supplements to start off. Uh, get your blood work checked, see where your levels are at, and then go from there. A lot of different supplements you can utilize to help with recovery, uh, with performance in the gym. Um, so I would recommend talking to a nutritionist first and then seeing what they say. Perfect. And uh, what supplements are you taking right now, personally? Currently, I am taking uh, pre-workout before the gym, protein powder after the gym, uh, I'm taking vitamin D3 uh, because in BC we don't get a lot of sunlight, so I, I have to supplement it. And then uh, I take creatine, and on occasion I will take magnesium and zinc before bed. And with pre-workout, what does that do for you? What is a pre-workout? So there are various different types of pre-workout. Uh, so you have your high stim pre-workout, and that's going to have a lot of caffeine in it. Uh, you have your nootropic pre-workouts, and that's more for brain function, for focus. Uh, and then you also have your pump pre-workouts as well. And this is for uh, getting more oxygen into the muscle to help with better performance. Right on. And uh, one supplement that gets a lot of attention is creatine. What does creatine do to the body? Creatine essentially takes your water and puts it into your muscles. This will help with better output in the gym. So it'll help with uh, strength training. It'll help with endurance, uh, just overall performance. Perfect. So with it pulling water away from your tissues and everything, it, would you recommend people drinking more water when they're taking creatine? Yes. If you are not consuming enough water when you're taking creatine, the creatine will not have much of an effect. Interesting. Social media has started to play a huge role in gym culture, sometimes resulting in an increase in poor self-image and body dysmorphia. How would you manage these feelings? So the best quote I have ever heard is, comparison is the thief of joy. And in this, when people are on social media and they're consuming all of these different physiques and everyone just looks incredible and then they look at themselves and they see this or what they think uh, is not so perfect so i would monitor the amount of social media that they consume uh, especially in this niche and just focus on their own fitness journey mm -hmm. and uh, building off of social media a lot of influencers are using performance enhancing drugs or PEDs. Only a small portion of these influencers are open about their usage while others keep it a secret. Can you elaborate further on these drugs and what the consequences of using them are? Yeah, so there are a lot of different types of PEDs out there and most of them will have negative side effects. Um, before consuming any PEDs, I recommend talking to a healthcare professional. Uh, talk to your doctor about it, get your blood work checked, and see if it's something that uh, you could use. The only form of uh, PEDs that I would possibly recommend would be a TRT through your doctor, uh, where they are monitoring your blood work, making sure that everything is normal, most other PEDs will have very negative side effects. Mm -hmm. If you're just tuning in now, this is a sound constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM. What are the side effects of using these drugs? And 
or the damages to the body. So when using steroids, when you're not going through your doctor, um, taking too much testosterone can uh, spike your estrogen. And when your estrogen spikes, it's hard to control mood swings. So when you have these mood swings, it's easy to lash out, to get very angry, uh, potentially violent. And then some other steroids such as Tren or Trenbolone was initially used for racehorses. So putting a substance like that in your body it might not be the greatest idea. Mm -mm. No, definitely not. Definitely not. And in regards to someone's mental health, using steroids can really have a negative impact on your mental health. So staying clear from them as much as possible is what you would recommend. Yeah, but especially if you're just starting out at the gym. It's like I said about Arnold, you're not going to walk into the gym looking like him. So start with the basics first and get your foundation going. Mm hmm. And regards to mental health and everything, um, how have you felt that working out and lifting and training has changed your mental health? Has it improved it or made it worse? What have you noticed about yourself? It's definitely improved it. The world can be quite cruel at times. So having that outlet, being able to go to the gym, uh, if you're angry or frustrated, uh, being able to have that outlet and putting it into the weights uh, rather than taking out on the people in your life uh, is definitely a bonus. Mm -hmm. Just a huge outlet to get the stress out and push it out. Exactly. There are different outlets that I recommend. Uh, some outlets, the gym is the perfect place to be to put your frustration in and possibly lift a little heavier than you normally would. Um, but if you're feeling sadness, then I'd recommend talking to either a counselor or a therapist and reaching out and talking to a professional and getting, getting some advice. Right on. It's always, the, always a great thing to do. What can you tell our listeners about certain diets? Because there have been a lot of fad diets that have gained traction on social media and as well as in the news and everything. Um, what diets would you recommend for somebody to follow? And <clears throat> how would somebody track that diet? So the best diet that you can follow is the one that you can adhere to. There's no point in starting a diet and not being able to do that over a long period of time. So generally what I recommend is to do either the 70-30 rule or the 80-20. And that basically means that 80% of your calories are going to be coming from clean sources, whether it's leafy greens, fruits, vegetables, uh, lean cuts of protein, even steak or fish. That way you do have a little bit of wiggle room so that that 20% of your diet is stuff that you can eat that you really enjoy. Uh, this is going to keep it so you're not going to have those days where you do anything for a cheat meal. It allows yourself to kind of have that open space so that if you want to have a chocolate bar or a piece of candy, then then you can do that. Mm -hmm. Regards to like tracking calories, what tools have you used? So I usually use my fitness pal. Uh, with that, it makes it extremely easy. I can scan the barcode of the foods that I'm going to be eating. Uh, so it's very easy to track that way. And then I also use a food scale as well to measure out my portion sizes. And MyFitnessPal, that's available on the App Store? Yeah, it's a free app. It's available for both iPhone and Android. Oh, perfect. With protein and carbs and fats, what are the best sources for each of those macros, as they're called? So the ones that I would recommend would be for protein either... Uh, chicken or red meat. Uh, they're both very high in nutrients. And then for carb sources, either potato or rice, uh, again, very easy to digest and both with very good uh, vitamins and minerals. And then for fats, usually I'd recommend either avocado or uh, peanut butter. Nice. 
what are the importance of getting enough of each of these macros in when training? So for protein, it's going to have amino acids, which are the building block for muscle tissue. So when you eat enough protein, it's not only going to allow you to grow to be bigger and help with performance, it's also going to help with recovery as well. So when you're going into the gym and you're giving your muscle that the, the stimulus to grow, having that protein and the amino acids is going to allow for better recovery so that you can get in the gym a lot quicker. Uh, as far as carbs go, this is your main energy source. So most carbs convert to sugars in our gut. So utilizing carbs uh, in and around a workout or if energy levels are low is going to help out a lot with fatigue. Uh, fats, healthy fats are going to help out with uh, hormone regulation. So consuming enough of healthy fats is going to help a lot with keeping everything intact. And what is a healthy fat? What are really good sources for these? Yeah, so I usually will try and get in a little bit of saturated fat, not too much. It's mostly trans fats that you want to stay away from. Um, fats digest the slowest in the body. So getting in healthy fats like uh, extra virgin olive oil, um, avocados, uh, even a little bit of peanut butter uh, will, will help a lot. And with the regulation of hormones too, that'll help with mood. Yeah, it'll help with mood. It'll help with energy. Uh, it'll also help with recovery as well. So better sleep. Mm. Sleep's very important. It is. It's something that a lot of people kind of push under the rug, but you should be aiming for at least eight hours. With training and maintaining a healthy diet, what is the most difficult of the two? And which one is the most important? Uh, for both, I would say diet. Uh, with your diet, the cleaner you eat, the better composition you'll have for your physique. And also, diet can be pretty hard to stick to. So when you can stick to it, it'll, it'll benefit you a lot in the long run. Mm -hmm. So for people who do struggle financially and can't afford the meats, especially with how expensive things are today, what would you recommend to buy to get the right amount of protein and fats and carbs that they need? So there are a lot of different options. Um, you can go to fattier cuts of meat, which will be less expensive if you're looking at chicken. So something like chicken thighs are going to be chicken, cheaper than a, th a chicken breast. Um, you can do canned tuna. Or it's not my favorite for taste, but it'll still do the trick. And generally protein powders for the amount that you get in protein are on the cheaper end as well. So you can utilize that. Uh, as far as carbs go, there are a lot of different sources that you can get. Um, you can use a loaf of bread and usually they're pretty inexpensive. Rice is pretty inexpensive, so you can bulk up on that. Uh, and eat it throughout the day. As far as fats go, it's not the most fun thing to do, but you can put uh, extra virgin olive oil in your shakes just to get in those extra calories. And with regards to mental health as well, maintaining a clean, healthy diet, would that help improve one's mental health as well as training? Yes, extremely. I would argue that diet would play more of a role than training. Um, but when you combine the two, then you get this extremely healthy balance. Having a well-balanced diet is going to lead to better mood, better energy levels. So having less fatigue, less brain fog is going to help a lot with just day-to-day -day life and frustration. Uh, it also helps with managing stress and anxieties as well. So I would say try to maintain a healthy, balanced diet, and it'll benefit your mental health a lot. So with somebody who is really not feeling themselves or doesn't feel as though they're ready, but they're interested in improving their diet, what strategies would you recommend them doing? I would say for the first week, try to not change it up too much. Just track what you're eating 
and watch. A lot of people don't pay much attention to what they're eating during the week. So they kind of just, they consume these calories, not knowing that a lot of those calories are empty calories. Empty calories are just not nutrient dense foods. So things like chips, cookies, candy bars, all of those things will have less nutrients than if you were to consume a salad or rice or potatoes. So watching what you eat will play a dramatic role in understanding what it's going to look like to change up your diet. And then once they've tracked their weekly diet, what small changes would they be able to make to their diet? Like what would you like someone to do? So again, with entering the gym, this is something that you want to take slow as well. Uh, the last thing you want to do is just completely change your diet to be just a hundred percent perfect. Slowly work into it because a lot of the processed foods are going to have a lot more calories than the nutrient dense foods. So when you change your calories in such a dramatic way, it can really uh, impact uh, performance. So my recommendation would be to just slowly swap things out. So say, for example, if you have McDonald's for dinner, just switch dinner, keep lunch and breakfast the exact same, but just switch your dinner and then slowly incorporate other meals. So say for a week, you just change your dinner the next week, maybe change your lunch and your dinner. And then after that, after you've done it for a week or two, then change your breakfast and slowly work your way into this healthy way of eating. Don't just jump into it. Yeah, ease into it. And then for people who are traveling a lot or may have like busy, busy lifestyles, like for a student, for example, what would you recommend for dieting there? Because being a student, being at school all day, there's not a lot of time to prep a meal for the day. What strategies would you recommend for that? So for that, I would recommend just easy meals, something that you don't have to put a lot of time into, something that you can make pretty fast. Uh, even for me, sometimes when I'm on the go, uh, I won't have a solid breakfast. I'll do a shake instead. So I'll put in my oats, my egg whites, my protein powder, uh, sometimes Greek yogurt, uh, maybe a scoop of peanut butter as well, uh, just to make sure that I'm getting in a decent amount of calories and a decent amount of macros uh, while still being able to get out of the house pretty fast. Combining that with the gym schedule as well and being on a busy life schedule with work, school, family, how would you recommend scheduling the gym around these things as well as dieting and everything else? So another part to dieting I would suggest would be meal prep is just even dedicating a single day to cooking so that when you're on the go, you can take around your meals with you. This will lead to a more stable diet, being able to have those meals on hand so that when you get hungry, when you're low energy, you have it ready to go. And then as far as going into the gym uh, on a busy schedule, if, if you work or you go to school and it's close to the gym, if you are able to, I would suggest just going to the gym straight after. That way you don't have time to go home, sit around uh, and uh, get cozy. Because generally when that happens, when you get cozy, it's pretty hard to leave the space that you're in. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Especially after a long day to come home, you just want to unwind, relax. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's pretty hard to, to get up and move after that. Mm -hmm. Definitely is. Unwinding this interview, thank you again, Cody, for being a part of the episode. Thank you very much for having me. If you want to follow Cody on social media, you can reach him at CNB Coaching on both TikTok and Instagram. And if you are interested in his programs, you can go to Cody's website at cnbcoaching.com. Thank you again, Cody, for being a part of A Sound Constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM. Now, back to the episode. And if you're just tuning in now, this is a sound constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM. A big thank you to Cody Brown. A big topic post within the interview revolved around steroid use and the effects they have on the body. I would like to add that we are not promoting the use of steroids. This is for educational purposes only. 
I'd like to introduce my co-host Ashley as she explains the harms of using steroids. Please welcome Ashley. Anabolic steroids are synthetic substances similar to the male hormone testosterone. Doctors prescribe them to treat problems such as delayed puberty and other medical problems that cause the body to make very low amounts of testosterone. Steroids make muscles bigger and bones stronger. They also may cause puberty to start and can help some boys who have a genetic disorder to grow more normally. Some examples of anabolic steroids are nandrolone, stanozolol, danazol, androl, and trenbolone acetate. Some common street names you may hear steroids being referred to as include Arnold's, Juice, Pumpers, Roids, Stackers, and Weight Gainers. Anabolic steroids may be taken as a pill, as a shot into a muscle, or as a gel or cream rubbed on the skin. In Canada, you need a prescription to get any anabolic steroid. Illegal anabolic steroids are those that people get without a doctor's prescription. Although some people take legal dietary supplements that have certain steroid hormones, also made by the human body. One such supplement is dehydroepiandosterone, also known as DHEA. The body can turn DHEA into other steroid hormones, including testosterone, estrogen, and cortisol. People use it to try to make their muscles bigger. While anabolic steroids do work, they are considered dangerous substances because of their potential to cause some very serious side effects. Some adults and teens use illegal anabolic steroids to lower body fat, get bigger muscles, and increase strength. They use the drugs because they are seeking to improve how well they play sports or how they look. It is estimated that over a million North Americans are currently using anabolic steroids, and many of these users are teenagers. The dose of illegal anabolic steroids is 10 to 100 times higher than the dose a doctor prescribes for medical problems. People often use more than one of these illegal drugs at the same time. This is called stacking. Or they may take the drugs in a cycle from no drug to a high dose over periods of weeks to months. This is called pyramiding. So what problems can using illegal anabolic steroids cause? Anabolic steroids can cause serious side effects. Some of these effects can be permanent. In men, anabolic steroids can reduce sperm count, shrink the testicles, cause you not to be able to father children, and enlarge the breasts. In women, anabolic steroids can increase body hair, make the skin rough, decrease breast size, enlarge the clitoris, and deepen the voice. In both men and women, anabolic steroids can cause high blood pressure, heart attacks, or strokes, higher levels of bad cholesterol and lower levels of good cholesterol, liver disease and possibly liver cancer, oily skin, acne, and male pattern hair loss, skin infections that can become severe if the drug was tainted with bacteria, irritability, rage, aggression, violence, uncontrolled high energy, and false beliefs. Teens who take illegal anabolic steroids are at risk for the same problems as adults who use them. Also, bone growth in teens may stop before it is complete the teen may not reach his or her full adult height. People who use anabolic steroids on a routine basis can have withdrawal symptoms when they stop taking them. Symptoms include having depression, being extremely tired, and having no desire to eat. The bottom line is that while anabolic steroids work to help build muscles, these dangerous substances should be avoided because of their long list of potentially serious side effects. Wow, thank you, Ashley. That is a lengthy list of side effects. With so many illegal substances present within the fitness industry, let's discuss a prominent legal supplement. In the interview with Cody, creatine was mentioned. I'd like to introduce Cassidy as she discusses the benefits of supplementing creatine and the effects it has on the body. Please welcome my co-host, Cassidy. Creatine is an amino acid located mostly in your body's muscles as well as in the brain and is one of your body's natural sources of energy from muscle contraction. Most people get creatine through seafood and red meat, though in levels far below those found in synthetically made creatine supplements. The body's liver, pancreas, and kidneys also can make about one gram of creatine per day. So why do people take creatine supplements? Professional and amateur athletes at all levels have been known to take creatine supplements to aid their workout routines and improve workout recovery. Creatine creates quick burst energy and increased strength, which improve performance but have little effect on aerobic endurance. No matter your age or health condition, talk to your doctor or healthcare provider before taking creatine supplements. 
Research shows that taking creatine supplements may improve your exercise performance, help your recovery time after intense exercise, prevent and reduce the severity of injury, help athletes tolerate heavy training loads, and increase your fat-free muscle mass during training. Because vegetarians have lower intramuscular creatine storage, they may see greater gains from taking the supplement. However, it may take longer to build up levels in the muscles. Several studies show that users experience less incidence of cramping, heat illness, muscle tightness, muscle strains, non-contact injuries, and total injuries or mispractices than those not taking creatine supplements. Creatine is a relatively safe supplement with few side effects reported. However, you should keep in mind that if you take creatine supplements, you may gain weight because of water retention in your body's muscles. It will take 7 to 28 days to see energy effects, depending on how much creatine you already have in your body. Creatine might benefit athletes who need short bursts of speed or increased muscle strength, such as sprinters, weightlifters, or team sport athletes. While taking creatine might not help all athletes, evidence suggests that it generally won't hurt if taken as directed. Although an older case study suggested that creatine might worsen kidney dysfunction in people with kidney disorders, creatine doesn't appear to affect kidney function in healthy people. When used orally at appropriate doses, creatine is likely safe to take for up to five years. As with any dietary supplement, it's important to choose a product that follows recommended manufacturing practices and subscribes to third-party testing to ensure the product's quality. It is also recommended that you talk to your doctor or healthcare provider before adding supplements to your diet. The following segment has been sourced from the Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic websites. Thank you, Cassidy. I'll be sure to contact my doctor before trying creatine. Moving over to mental health, I have a TED Talk I'd like to share titled, How to Make Stress Your Friend, presented by Kelly McGonigal. Kelly McGonigal is a health psychologist and lecturer at Stanford University. In this TED Talk, McGonigal describes a study that took place in America that tracked the stress of 30,000 participants over eight years. The key questions that were asked were, how much stress have you experienced in the past year? And do you believe stress is harmful for your health? We feel as a group, this TED Talk is important as we all experience stress to some degree. And after watching this TED Talk, I have found personally that my views on stress have changed for the better. And I hope yours does as well. I hope you enjoy this TED Talk, How to Make Stress Your Friend, presented by Kelly McGonigal. I have a confession to make. But first, I want you to make a little confession to me. In the past year, I want you to just raise your hand if you've experienced relatively little stress. Anyone? Mm -hmm. How about a moderate amount of stress? Who's experienced a lot of stress? Yeah, <laughs> me too. But that is not my confession. My confession is this, I am a health psychologist, and my mission is to help people be happier and healthier. But I fear that something I've been teaching for the last 10 years is doing more harm than good, and it has to do with stress. For years, I've been telling people stress makes you sick. It increases the risk of everything from the common cold to cardiovascular disease. Basically, I've turned stress into the enemy, but I've changed my mind about stress, and today, I want to change yours. Let me start with the study that made me rethink my whole approach to stress. This study tracked 30,000 adults in the United States for eight years, and they started by asking people, how much stress have you experienced in the last year? They also asked, do you believe that stress is harmful for your health? And then they used public death records to find out who died. <laughs> okay, some bad news first. People who experienced a lot of stress in the previous year had a 43% increased risk of dying. But that was only true for the people who also believed that stress is harmful for your health. People who experienced a lot of stress but did not view stress as harmful were no more likely to die. In fact, they had the lowest risk 
of dying of anyone in the study, including people who had relatively little stress. Now, the researchers estimated that over the eight years they were tracking deaths, 182,000 Americans died prematurely, not from stress, but from the belief that stress is bad for you. <laughs> that is over 20,000 deaths a year. Now, if that estimate is correct, that would make believing stress is bad for you the 15th largest cause of death in the United States last year, killing more people than skin cancer, HIV, AIDS, and homicide. <laughs> you can see why the study freaked me out. Here I've been spending so much energy telling people stress is bad for your health. So this study got me wondering, can changing how you think about stress make you healthier? And here the science says yes. When you change your mind about stress, you can change your body's response to stress. Now, to explain how this works, I want you all to pretend that you are participants in a study designed to stress you out. It's called the social stress test. You come into the laboratory and you're told you have to give a five-minute impromptu speech on your personal weaknesses to a panel of expert evaluators sitting right in front of you. And to make sure you feel the pressure, there are bright lights and a camera in your face, kind of like this. And the evaluators have been trained to give you discouraging nonverbal feedback, <laughs> like this. Now that you're sufficiently demoralized, time for part two, a math test. And unbeknownst to you, the experimenter has been trained to harass you during it. Now, we're going to all do this together. It's going to be fun for me. OK. <laughs> I want you all to count backwards from 996 in increments of seven. You're going to do this out loud as fast as you can, starting with 996. Go. Go faster. Faster, please. You're going too slow. Stop, 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 stop. That guy made a mistake. We're going to have to start all over again. You're not very good at this, are you? OK, so you get the idea. Now, if you were actually in this study, you'd probably be a little stressed out. Your heart might be pounding. You might be breathing faster, maybe breaking out into a sweat. And normally, we interpret these physical changes as anxiety or signs that we aren't coping very well with the pressure. But what if you viewed them instead as signs that your body was energized, was preparing you to meet this challenge? Now, that is exactly what participants were told in a study conducted at Harvard University. Before they went through the social stress test, they were taught to rethink their stress response as helpful. That pounding heart, is preparing you for action. If you're breathing faster, it's no problem. It's getting more oxygen to your brain. And participants who learned to view the stress response as helpful for their performance, well, they were less stressed out, less anxious, more confident. But the most fascinating finding to me was how their physical stress response changed. Now, in a typical stress response, your heart rate goes up and your blood vessels constrict like this. And this is one of the reasons that chronic stress is sometimes associated with cardiovascular disease. It's not really healthy to be in this state all the time. But in the study, when participants viewed their stress response as helpful, their blood vessels stayed relaxed like this. Their heart was still pounding, but this is a much healthier cardiovascular profile. It actually looks a lot like what happens in moments of joy and courage. Over a lifetime of stressful experiences, this one biological change could be the difference between a stress-induced heart attack at age 50 and living well into your 90s. And this is really what the new science of stress reveals, that how you think about stress matters. So my goal as a health psychologist has changed. I no longer want to get rid of your stress. I want to make you better at stress. And we just did a little intervention. If you raised your hand and said you'd had a lot of stress in the last year, we could have saved your life. Because hopefully, the next time your heart is pounding from stress, you're going to remember this talk, and you're going to think to yourself, this is my body 
helping me rise to this challenge. And when you view stress in that way, your body believes you and your stress response becomes healthier. If you're just tuning in now, this is A Sound Constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM. Now, I said, I have over a decade of demonizing stress to redeem myself from. So we are going to do one more intervention. I want to tell you about one of the most underappreciated aspects of the stress response. And the idea is this. Stress makes you social. To understand the side of stress, we need to talk about a hormone, oxytocin. And I know oxytocin has already gotten as much hype as a hormone can get. It even has its own cute nickname, the cuddle hormone, because it's released when you hug someone. But this is a very small part of what oxytocin is involved in. Oxytocin is a neurohormone. It fine-tunes your brain's social instincts. It primes you to do things that strengthen close relationships. Oxytocin makes you crave physical contact with your friends and family. It enhances your empathy. It even makes you more willing to help and support the people you care about. Some people have even suggested we should snort oxytocin right? to become more compassionate and caring. But here's what most people don't understand about oxytocin. It's a stress hormone. Your pituitary gland pumps this stuff out as part of the stress response. It's as much a part of your stress response as the adrenaline that makes your heart pound. And when oxytocin is released in the stress response, it is motivating you to seek support. Your biological stress response is nudging you to tell someone how you feel instead of bottling it up. Your stress response wants to make sure you notice when someone else in your life is struggling so that you can support each other. When life is difficult, your stress response wants you to be surrounded by people who care about you. Okay, so how is knowing this side of stress going to make you healthier? Well, oxytocin doesn't only act on your brain, it also acts on your body. And one of its main roles in your body is to protect your cardiovascular system from the effects of stress. It's a natural anti-inflammatory. It also helps your blood vessels stay relaxed during stress. But my favorite effect on the body is actually on the heart. Your heart has receptors for this hormone. And oxytocin helps heart cells regenerate and heal from any stress-induced damage. This stress hormone strengthens your heart. And the cool thing is, is that all of these physical benefits of oxytocin are enhanced by social contact and social support. So when you reach out to others under stress, either to seek support or to help someone else, you release more of this hormone, your stress response becomes healthier, and you actually recover faster from stress. I find this amazing that your stress response has a built-in mechanism for stress resilience. And that mechanism is human connection. I want to finish by telling you about one more study. And listen up, because this study could also save a life. This study tracked about 1,000 adults in the United States, and they ranged in age from 34 to 93. And they started the study by asking, how much stress have you experienced in the last year? They also asked, how much time have you spent helping out friends, neighbors, people in your community? And then they used public records for the next five years to find out who died. OK, so the bad news first. <laughs> For every major stressful life experience, like financial difficulties or family crisis, that increased the risk of dying by 30%. But, and I hope you are expecting a but by now, but that wasn't true for everyone. People who spent time caring for others showed absolutely no stress-related increase in dying, zero. Caring created resilience. And so we see once again that the harmful effects of stress on your health are not inevitable. How you think 
and how you act can transform your experience of stress. When you choose to view your stress response as helpful, you create the biology of courage. And when you choose to connect with others under stress, you can create resilience. Now, I wouldn't necessarily ask for more stressful experiences in my life, but this science has given me a whole new appreciation for stress. Stress gives us access to our hearts. The compassionate heart that finds joy and meaning in connecting with others. And yes, your pounding physical heart working so hard to give you strength and energy. And when you choose to view stress in this way, you're not just getting better at stress, you're actually making a pretty profound statement. You're saying that you can trust yourself to handle life's challenges. And you're remembering that you don't have to face them alone. Thank you. And that was How to Make Stress Your Friend, a TED Talk presented by health psychologist Kelly McGonigal. Again, I would like to reinstate that all information in this episode is for educational purposes only. It does not replace the advice of your primary healthcare professional. Seasons change, and so does the amount of sunlight we receive. I'd like to welcome my co-host, Ashley, and her findings on seasonal depression. Please welcome Ashley. Did you know that seasonal depression is real? It's called Seasonal Affective Disorder, or abbreviated as SAD. Side effects include feeling sluggish or agitated, having low energy, and feeling hopeless or worthless during the winter months. Treatments include taking antidepressants, using light therapy, and consuming vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is synthesized through the skin in the sunlight and is thought to aid increasing serotonin also known as your happy hormone. Just a reminder here that the information provided today does not replace health instructions from your primary healthcare provider. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Make sure to stock up on your vitamin D3 in the winter months, especially here in British Columbia. And if you are struggling with your mental health, Ashley has also listed some resources available to us locally. Thank you, Tyler. So for anyone who missed it, I'll be sharing some of Vancouver Island and Nanaimo's mental health services. For any of our listeners that attend VIU, there's counseling services on campus. If you're interested in counseling, you can learn more at services.viu.ca slash counseling. They are open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Tuesday and Thursday is 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. A 24-7 option is the Vancouver Island Crisis Line, which is a service contracted by the Provincial Health Services Authority and Island Health. You can call this line via phone at 188-494-3888, and this is 24-7. Or you can text or chat at 250-800-3806 from 6 to 10 p.m. Another valuable resource in Nanaimo is called the Haven Society. Uh, they aim to promote safety of women, children, and youth experiencing hardship and violence in their environment. They are located in Nanaimo and their phone number is 250-756-2452 and they're open Monday to Friday at 8.30 until 4.30. And they have drop-in hours Monday to Friday from 1 to 3 p.m. And this is for adult and transgender women experiencing abuse. If you would like to learn more about the services provided by the Haven Society, visit their website at www.havensociety.com. Island Health's Mental Health Services provides free, no appointment necessary services to any person who has a major mental illness, an addiction, or an acute emotional distress. Their services include mobile community crisis response teams, crisis counseling, withdrawal management support, and they help to connect members of the community with an appropriate mental health and substance use, community or hospital program, treatments, or recovery services. 
Their hours are Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 6.15 p.m. in Nanaimo at the Brooks Landing Mall, 2000 North Island Highway. The Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions also has crisis hotlines and virtual health care for the community. You can call a mental health support line at 310-6789 or you can call the crisis line at 1-800-SUICIDE. To learn more about this resource, please visit wellbeing.gov.bc.ca. If you have any health-related questions, please feel free to contact HealthLink BC at 811 to reach a registered nurse, a dietitian, an exercise professional, or a pharmacist to assist you with any medical concerns. So everyone, I hope you find these resources useful, and if you or anyone you know is in a crisis and needs medical attention, please always call 911. Thank you so much for listening. Now back to you, Tyler. Thank you, Ashley. Those are some excellent resources. Closing down this episode, I'd like to give a big thank you to our special guest, Cody Brown, for being a part of A Sound Constitution and sharing your knowledge around training and dieting. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule and being a part of our show. I would like to give a big thank you to my co-hosts, Ashley, Cassidy, and Ashley, for sharing information regarding steroids, creatine, and seasonal affected disorder, as well as for providing mental health resources within our community. And lastly, I would like to thank our listeners for joining us today and listening to our episode on health and wellness. For details and show notes from today's episode, or to follow along on what's coming up next this season, check out our Facebook page at A Sound Constitution, our Instagram page at chly, a sound constitution, all one word, and our Twitter page at asc.viu. If you have missed parts of this episode or want to listen to more episodes, check out our YouTube page at A Sound Constitution. I hope you enjoyed our episode today. This has been A Sound Constitution on CHLY 101.7 FM. And I hope to catch you all on next week's episode. <laughs>